Hello, welcome. Wow, so many people here. I hope uh, thank you for coming to this talk and I hope you find it useful and uh, enjoy it. So uh, I'm Sen Barasic and today I'm going to talk about uh, how and why to build a good web API. So I work at a company called GoodCode, which is a web development agency uh, located here in Zagreb and we are working for clients all over the world on various projects from small to some uh, larger business uh, critical applications and by the way we are hiring so if you are uh, if you want to work with great people with projects uh, please get in touch so in our work uh, we've come across we've seen a lot of very different APIs and we've built a lot of different APIs and some of the stuff that we have seen was great some of the stuff that that we have seen was so-so, and some of the APIs were really, really horrible. So from this experience, we have still some kind of like experience in which things work, which th things don't work, uh, what to do, what are the best practices. And this talk is about these. So today, I'm going to uh, first try to convince you that building and uh, thinking about good web API design is important. And then I'm tr I'll try to show you a few pointers, a few best practices, a few starter tips to, to, to make your API good. So first, I, I want to stress that the good web API design is important. So why is this? For three reasons. The first reason is that the API, the I in API is an interface. So when you're building a web application, if you're building a, something that your users uh, come and interact with, you're very concerned with, and you should be, with user experience, with user interface. And in the same vein, uh, when you're building an API that, some, that somebody will use, be it you in 12 months, or your colleague, or somebody across the planet, you should think about their experience and uh, their expectations of, of an interface, of something that they have to use. So I think the parallels with user experience are, are really good. So you want your API and, and your UX to be, uh, you want the API to be consistent. You don't want to surprise your developers and you don't want to force them to think about how to do something. Your API is not a mystery now. The idea is to let developers just focus on their problem and then not think about how somebody, some, uh, something in your API is supposed to work. So consistency, uh, principle of least astonishment, uh, following the best practices or rules of the day are things that will help uh, you and uh, the users and consumers of this API a lot. And even if you're the only one ever thinking about this API, or you don't care about the user or developer experience, uh, you should, you should still talk, uh, think hard about how to design a web API. And why is that? So in any larger uh, software application, be it on web or on desktop or whatever, you think about how it's divided in, into components. So in MVC frameworks you have a set of models, controllers, uh, templates, presenters, and so on. And you think hard about how these class APIs are organized, how, or which design patterns you're using, and so on. But if you uh, take a step back and look at the big picture, if you're working with something on the web, and probably most of you do, uh, there's this huge chunk of components on the server side, which is your, big, your backend, your uh, API service and a uh, chunk of components on the client side. This might be a JavaScript in the browser, this might be a native uh, mobile application or a desktop application, or somebody else's server. And these two sets of components again communicate together using some sort of interface. So if you're thinking about how to design a class interface, you should also be thinking about how to design a, a web-based API, uh, how, to, how to organize your web endpoints and so on. Even more so, because in the case of Web uh, APIs, you have the unreliability of HTTP. Uh, the connection can grow. Your API call can crash through no fault of your own. And also, obviously, these calls are much, much slower than, than the calls inside your application, be it server side or uh, on the front, because function calls is much faster than the HTTP call. So, we're thinking about what the HTTP call do, uh, what are uh, is the response going to look like, and so on. You have to think hard about these extra constraints that you don't have when you're just building a local application. So, how would you go about uh, how how would you go about doing this? 
So uh, again, to draw parallels from the from the uh, UX and UI crowd, they don't actually have some set of rules that you have to follow. They have best practices, which sometimes are uh, make sense. Sometimes it makes sense to break. Them. But in, in the API world, if we we'll if we are building API on top of HTTP, we can use everything that HTTP provides. So in some APIs that we have used, uh, people just ignored all the features of HTTP and treat it as a, a dump pipe. And then invented their own protocol on top of it. Just ignoring everything that HTTP already provides. So don't do that. HTTP uh, already provides a nice set of like Lego bricks that you can use and building blocks that you can just build up, uh, on top of instead of reinventing, reinventing the deal. So uh, the first example here uh, that I'd like to point out is in the olden days, before the popularity of web frameworks, the URL on the top, the code on the top that you, you can see is probably something that was very familiar to everybody. So you had one, one endpoint and then you, get, you gave it commands, oh, please delete this record of type author with this ID of type file. So this basically ignores everything that HTTP provides. For one, it provides uh, the dispatch of your methods on the URL. So uh, nowadays, most, I think all of the frameworks uh, just attract that, so that it, it's not a problem anymore. But basically, if you have the, the something called URL that you can uh, uh, encode the information about what kind of product, uh, um, object it is, and what, uh, what the idea of, of the object it is, and so on, just use that. And uh, another thing that people still, we, we see, uh, still uh, use today is overusing the get method. So I'd like to just uh, give a brief recap of what each of these uh, HTTP methods uh, provides and why and uh, what it should be used for. So get should only ever, ever, ever be used if you don't need to change the state of the server. So the server side should uh, be should have no side effects and it shouldn't care less about uh, whether you call this uh, get operation zero times, one time, or, or a hundred million thousand times. If you want to change something on the server, use uh, uh, post or put or delete and so on. So, uh, for example, uh, as a typical as example that actually happened to, to someone is when you have uh, some kind of admin interface and you have the roles in the database and they have a links to delete roles and these links are get roles. And then a uh, greedy browser can just try to preload uh, these deleted pages because they're just hyperlinks, they use get, and then deletes everything in the database. This actually happened. And, uh, so there's, there's a good read, there, there's a, like, a rule in the sense of our, uh, HTTP standard that says don't do this, and there's practical consequences if you do this. Also, browsers can cache the GET request and so on. And uh, if you want to change the state of the server, probably like most of you will already have used post or some other method. But it makes sense to try and distinguish between what's, what's the correct one. So post should be used in general sense when we have to make some modification on the server. For example, submit a form which will trigger a, a email a contact or to create a new resource, or something like that. Uh, for specific, uh, more narrowed down uh, intentions that we have, for example, to uh, create or modify a resource. So when I say resource, that, that might be an object in your database, in most uh, sense. But anything that you, you can uniquely identify by having some sort of identity and, and confirmation. Mostly a record in your database. Uh, so people, uh, so, so you can use uh, put to uh, upload or to change or to modify something that's already on the server. Uh, if that uh, object is huge and you don't want to upload it uh, the entire to just, for example, change one flag in it, you can use patch. Uh, I don't know if patch is uh, well uh, supported in all browsers yet, but uh, like put and patch is more or less uh, what your preference is. And if you want to delete something on the, on the server, you can just use the delete method. And the flip side of this is using the correct HTTP status codes. So everybody is familiar with 200 OK, uh, 400 bad, bad requests, and uh, service available that's uh, five But 
I've seen and worked with API to just return 200 for, that, for everything. And then you have to inspect the payload and hope that the payload in case of error is always have, has the same uh, the keys in JSON or something. So you hope that you will be able to catch the error if you have it. Don't do that. It really provides a nice starting point for your, for your responses. So uh, the responses that HTTP provides are not the, the end of it. You're probably not giving enough information to, to the client side if you just say, no, no, this form submission is invalid, that's 400. So you, you will probably want to extend this with information about what exactly went wrong in the payload of the, of the response. But uh, this is no excuse to not use uh, HTTP codes as well, because uh, when, when making a client library, when, when accessing this kind of service, uh, using the standard code, HTTP error codes and status codes means that everybody who is who is developing client side, who is using the web API, who is used to using HTTP-based API, will know how it works. They will just need to see the details. So they will not uh, uh, run counter to their uh, existing uh, knowledge. And uh, if you're already doing 200 for something that, that was good, 400 something that was for, for user error and so on, you might uh, want to go even further and say uh, when you create something new on the server, that's 201 created. If you delete something and there, there's no content to return, to return then that, that might be 204 and so on. So uh, like, look, look into the, the, status of, uh, the list of the HTTP status codes and see how well they map to your application. So they don't have exact specific set meanings but uh, they, they, are, they come pretty close and you can, in, in, much, in, in many situations, you, you can uh, figure out which of the codes uh, maps to your uh, situation pretty well. Uh, next thing important in Web API design is how you're going to do your authentication and authorization. There's basically two most popular uh, ways to do it. First is to have session-based authentication. This is what happens when you log into some website you are browsing it as a login user, then you log out, that's, that's session view. The way it works is uh, your server uh, gives you a session ID cookie, and then each time you, you, exit, uh, you make a request to that server, based on the session ID, the server knows who you are. This is great for workflows in which the consumer of the API is JavaScript in the browser, because the, the, uh, the browser already does everything for us, we just need to, from the client side. We just need to uh, make sure that the login flow uh, happens and then use the session ID to figure out who the user is. In case of the API being consumed by the native application, uh, mobile application or um, some, some other server that calls our API, it's actually easier to use token-based authentication. So in session-based authentication, you have to do first login, then you have a session, then you log out. Uh, if the consumer of the API is just a native application, this login and logout step is not necessary. So it's easier to just send the uh, information about the client, in this case this is some kind of uh, client, uh, client token, uh, to the server in every request. And again, HTTP provides ways to do that. It, uh, it defines a standard uh, authorization header that we can just do that. On the topic of security, just use HTTPS. If you have any reason to hide any portion of your data from the general public and from, from Reddit and from 4chan and from Luca and his uh, bad list, then use HTTPS everywhere. So people sometimes say, okay, I'm going to use HTTPS for logging screens. Yeah, then afterwards your session cookie uh, gets passed in clear text and it gets hijacked in a couple of seconds. So just use HTTPS. Uh, the certificates are, you can get them for free. The, uh, nowadays, the, the, the web hosting companies and the VPS hosting companies offer you uh, ways to use HTTPS for really uh, like not a lot of money. So if you care about the, uh, the privacy of the, your user's data, and you don't want, if you don't have all public service, just use the HTTPS server and make your life uh, easier. Uh, also, take a hard look uh, at your uh, web API framework that you're using. So you're probably going to use uh, some kind of web framework to uh, abstract the REST semantics. 
And sometimes these frameworks, uh, because the, the framework authors, because they want to like show you everything works exactly as you want out of the box and everything is just like plug and play, they, they might enable all the, all the operations uh, on, the, on your objects in the database by default. So if you don't like, look specifically, you might just enable everyone to uh, create or update or delete stuff in your database. So take a look at that. Also try to be consistent. So there's lots of ways that like people people can different in how they want to organize, for example, the URLs, the, the payload format uh, for, for the errors or success uh, payload that gets returned to the client and so on. So for example, if you have two URLs and one is authors without a slash and one is books with a slash, and then the developer on the, on the client side has to each time think about, oh, whether that slash went here or didn't go here, and then they burn their brain cycles on something that's totally irrelevant and brings no help to either them or you. To pick anything and be consistent about it. <coughs> the same goes for backwards, backwards compatibility. So imagine you have built an API, you have published it, somebody across the planet has used it. They have their application in production using your API and then you bring it. And then you are a complete jerk. Don't do that. The, you, you, you destroy the, their application, you destroy their trust in you. And like, there's, there's basically no reason why you should ever try to break somebody's uh, working application by changing your API. If you need to change something, add, add new uh, methods, add new endpoints, uh, version your API so you can, you can have version 1, version 2, version 75. Just don't break the API. So the only exception to this would be if you really need to close some security fix that affects your user. So, uh, instead of them getting home, you might just break the application so this is a lesson to use. But in general, don't be lazy, try to, to never break the expectation that the user has about what was previously or documented and supported. So, in this talk, uh, I just mentioned a couple of really basic points about like, in which direction you should think about when uh, approaching the, the design of your API. Uh, if you're interested to hear more about uh, uh, more advanced topics about design REST based APIs, I can recommend you uh, Google this, uh, YouTube search this, uh, this video. This is from a client of ours, Stormpad. They do cloud based authentication, and this is an hour and a half long video. Uh, discussing a lot of very, very interesting topics if you're interested in the rest of the uh, API design. So just to conclude, uh, be consistent, uh, be backwards compatible, uh, use the features that, as, uh, that uh, HTTP provides. If you care about privacy and security of your data, use HTTPS. And really, the developer experience matters. So if you think, these things are not hard. If you, if you take a bit of trouble to just Think about how you can do it, uh, how you can make it better for the end user of your API. You will make both yours and theirs life happy. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Anyone?
Yeah. Okay. Uh, I have a question regarding um, post requests. Okay, I know that they should be used for creating resource only. But do you agree that sometimes it is okay to use it for get requests? So in case we have a really gigantic filter, let's say, some query that cannot be put into get because of the restriction of length of URL. Uh, sure. Yeah. So if you, if you if you ideally if you use get, but for some reason it's easier for you to use post. You don't you don't break don't break anything. But uh, the, the other way around is this problem. So if you should be using post because you don't want, you're changing something in this way, you should really not be using that. Uh, hi, uh, I have a question about authentication. Uh, how to reconcile like uh, token authentication with uh, a login? I mean, for example, you have a web browser as a client, but you also have a native clients as a client. So you need to issue tokens, but also cookies. So I don't know. That's a great question. Know. Use both. You can you can just use both. There's there's nothing. There, there's no no reason why you you, should, you couldn't just check the uh, the session cookie okay. and then or after like in any in any. Uh, uh, priority check the authorization, uh, authorization panel. Yeah. Uh, I tend to, I want, to, I want to make the API stateless, so I just want to use like token authentication error. So, but how to get a simple login form there? I mean, just return the token that will then be put into authorization header or what? I mean, is is there like any idea? In, in this case, it? I think I'm, I just use both. And there's there's one more reason why both is, is maybe a good answer. And this is because of uh, uh, CSRF. So, in session-based in session workflow, you don't want anybody outside your website to be able to construct a form that some uh, that your user will click and then do something very bad on, on the website. So you use some kind of CSRF tokens to prevent uh, to prevent that. But in uh, if talking about the API used by native clients, it's by definition used by somebody outside. So in this sense, if if somebody was authenticated via the session, you should check the CSRF token. And if it was via the API, then you're okay. Hi. Um, I'm interested in uh, what would be your approach uh, for sending related links uh, to the client for the get response. Right, so uh, there's basically two approaches that you can make. Either just send IDs, which is like the easy way out, or you can just, or you can create the, uh, the entire links to the resource that this is, the, 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 that's related to the resource that you return. Uh, oh, okay, but w would you send that in the body of the uh, uh, response or in the header? Or? What would be an approach? Usually, usually I'd send that in a body, but I don't think that's necessarily the correct or the better way. I think that uh, varies uh, according to your situation and according to your style. So there's all this like, topic of hypermedia as the attention of the application state, ATOS, which says that the API should be discoverable. So you should send in more metadata, more information about the resource and the uh, related resources in the body or in the links of the, of the payload. But there's no like, hard consensus to how to do that and what's, what's best to do. So there's like three or four different ways that people are trying to solve that. Okay, thanks. Uh, more questions? Yes. Hi, sorry. So, um, great presentation. Thank you for that. My question would be about the naming conventions used in the service endpoint. So just to relate back to your example, you had, um, I think it was authors. So you have get authors, which would list you know, all the authors in, in your system. So then if you would want information about one, sing one single author, would you change the 
the endpoint to say author slash and the ID, or would you still use the plural form of the endpoint? So just what's your take on that? Yeah, ideally, it would be a similar form, but I think that would go against uh, the, the uh, consistency. So people would not necessarily expect that, especially if, well, they're probably like good English uh, readers, but still, uh, it would, it would, I think it would harm consistency to the different things. Maybe better for me. Maybe do similar for, for both. That's all. Again, not very nice sounding, but I'd go for consistency. <coughs> We are, we are out of time. Thank you, Senghor. <laughs>